Hi there. Welcome. Good morning. Good snowy morning to everyone. Welcome back after our short break uh, to the webinar series, Working with Children and Youth with Complex Mental Health Needs. I'm Renee Ferguson. I am your host as usual. And today we're going to be looking at child protection laws, obligations, and Today we're also going to try something a bit different, a different format than we've used in the previous webinars. Uh, we're going to be doing breakout groups, so I'll explain how we'll do that in a little bit, about halfway through the webinar, but it's a good chance for you to be able to interact directly with both the presenter and with uh, other people who are attending the webinar who are in the field and who may have some uh, pretty good ideas about uh, what to do. Um, going to speak up a little bit because I think maybe some people might be having difficulty hearing me. Uh, so quick question, as usual, want to find out who's been with us before. So if you take a look at your screen, you'll see, uh, there you go, you know what to do. So we're looking at a few people who have been here. Most people actually have been with us for all of the webinars. And we've got a few who are here for the first time give you a few more seconds. We've got a lot of first timers. Okay, so it's great. So welcome to the people who are joining us for the first time. Welcome back to the people who are here again. And for the people who are here again and the people who are joining us for the first time, we're doing a new platform. So it's new for all of us. So uh, for those of us who are new, just to remind you uh, that this webinar is part of a larger project, which is a joint initiative between Ontario Mental Health Association and MCYS. And the purpose is to offer foundation training to direct service providers in Ontario working with children and youth with complex mental health needs. So the focus uh, are four pieces of training. Uh, the first piece is a live inventory that's hosted on the website www.complexneeds.ca and that's uh, a compilation of training that's actually happening across the province. So if you're sitting here right now thinking that uh, you know of a training that's happening, please feel free to log on to the website and you can actually uh, type the training right in so you can help to advertise it to your colleagues. Uh, the other is a, a series of webinars for which this is one of them. And uh, for those of you who haven't been to the first five webinars, you can actually check those out at www.complexneeds.ca and you can see the recordings there. Uh, then we have the two-day face-to-face training. There are four that have happened across the province. We've done three of the four. The next one is happening in London, Ontario in January. And again, you can check out the website for more details on that. And then finally is a six-part online course that will be available as of January, the end of January 2015. And you'll be able to register for that next week, again, by logging on the website www.complexneeds.ca. So check it out. Uh, there's lots of interesting things happening there. And you'll be able to actually catch uh, any of the resources that we've made reference to today and the PowerPoint as well on the website. So for today's webinar, we're going to be welcoming Bram Goldenberg, who's the Child Protection Supervisor at CAS Toronto. He is our only presenter today, and we're excited to have him uh, because he has a number of years of expertise in the area. Uh, and my question before we start and introduce Bram is to start to kind of think about why we're even making this connection between complex mental health needs and uh, child protection or child welfare. So I'm going to ask you guys again to look on your screen. You'll have a chance to answer this question and really thinking about what's the link. So why is this important? I'm going to, wrong question. Let's go back up here. There we go. What's the link? Why is this imp an important topic to be thinking about when we're thinking about children and youth with complex mental health needs? I'll give you a few minutes to answer, type in your answer. Anyone have any ideas? Why would we need to be making a connection between supporting and caring for children and youth with complex mental health needs and child protection services. 
We've got a few. We've got some good answers. Exactly. So we have considering family environment, right? Uh, how to assist service users or clients, being able to offer appropriate resources, exactly. Uh, someone wrote that it's a vulnerable group. Absolutely, some great answers, lots of answers. Um, in many cases, we're looking at children who have suffered abuse by trauma. Understanding the situation helps us to be able to help more, and you can have the right match of services. Excellent. Uh, key one, must be aware of duty to report if it's an issue. Uh, we'll be talking about that. Burnout for caregivers, coordinate services, absolutely great. Intercultural intervention, mental health impacts function, uh, finding the best solution for services, great. Thank you very much. I'm going to end this poll. So you have some great answers and some really bang on answers especially when thinking about service coordination, which is essentially what we're speaking about today. Uh, there's work done by Dr. Ungar uh, Leibenberg and Aikida, who really look at um, this population as being a vulnerable population in that uh, oftentimes they are people who are using multiple services that aren't necessarily coordinated that well, even though uh, workers are really doing their best. So in addition to resilience, well-coordinated service delivery systems actually prevent exposure to risk. So it's kind of like a protective uh, barrier. So essentially more understanding of what happens within children's aid societies uh, will actually increase our ability to improve our coordination for this population. So that's why it's really important. And then in the long run, it also equates to some of the other things that you've mentioned, including things like worker burnout, uh, being able to find the right fit uh, for your service users. So a couple of more things to remember um, just around project definitions. For this project, uh, when we talk about youth, we're really referring to individuals from 0 to age 29, and that's also to include the transitional years. Uh, and then our definition of complex mental health needs. So again, thinking about children and youth who are experiencing significant, multiple, rare or persistent mental health challenges that impact their functioning in most areas. So thinking about the home, school, community. So examples of this are, um, are but not limited to children and youth who are living with co-occurring disorders, multiple diagnoses, living with disorders impacted by social exclusion, involvement with the just, uh, justice system, histories of trauma, as you've already mentioned earlier. So these are children and youth who are in high need of multiple coordinated services and resources, independent of whether or not they're actually accessing them. Because we also know that there are multiple uh, children and youth who may not actually access those services, but who need them. So we really need to think about that group as well. So I encourage you to check out the website, www.complexneeds.ca. And on that note, I would like to uh, give a warm welcome to Bram. Welcome. All right, good, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Bram Goldenberg, and I'm a supervisor at Children's Aid Society of Toronto, where I've worked for the past 15 years. I supervise a group of staff made up of set, uh, seven or eight social workers who work with children and their families. In addition to my role as a supervisor, I also belong to the agency's Speak Speakers Bureau, and that's a group of staff who give of their time to go out in the community to deliver talks like this, to talk about the work that we do at Children's Aid. So I really want to thank Renee and Meredith for inviting me here today to talk about our work. Our mission at Children's Aid is to ensure that every child in Toronto grows up safely, free from abuse and neglect, so they can lead healthy and happy lives. We know we can't do this alone, and we need your professional knowledge and insight into the family situation. We need, your report, need you to report your suspicions of child abuse, as well as partner with us to best help children and their families. So in terms of an agenda for today, I wanted to talk a little bit about who we are as an agency, the types of cases we intervene, the types of families we help, 
Um, what happens after someone makes a call to the Children's Aid Society? And um, then we're going to do something, as Renee said, we're going to talk, I'm going to talk a little bit of a few case examples. I'm going to put some questions to you to get the group of you thinking. So I'm going to just jump to the next slide. So who we are. So as probably most of you know, um, our mandate is to provide services to ensure children are safe at home with their families. We're governed by the Child and Family Service Act. That's a piece of legislation which spells out what the expectations and responsibilities uh, are of a child welfare agency. The Children's Aid Society of Toronto is one of about 50 child welfare agencies in Ontario um, that, um, that do this work. We know that children do best when they are with their family. It is therefore our goal, whenever possible, to keep children with their families. And if the group were in front of me, rather than me speaking at a box, I, I would ask people what they would think of in terms of the number of families that we work with, or percentage of families that we work with, where the children are living with their parents. The, uh, the popular uh, misconception is that the vast majority of the work we do with, with children and their families is, is with the children in our care. And actually, that's not true at all. In fact, um, just rough, the rough math is more than 90% of the children and families that we work with, um, the children are living with their biological families. In, in a handful of other cases, the parents themselves have asked us to place their children in care. That's about, I would say, about 5%. Then there's another 2 or 3% of families where the parent has asked us for a variety of reasons. Perhaps it's around their own mental health issues or their parenting challenges or um, domestic violence, substance misuse, or the whole host of social problems that the society, um, the Children's Aid Society gets involved in. They ask us to place their child with a family member. Another small group, maybe 1 or 2%, of the families we work with, um, we don't, the society does not believe it's safe for a child to remain with their parents, and we explore a family member that we believe is a safe person or, or group of people that can care for a child. And while the parent themselves, the biological parent themselves may not agree with that plan, we go to court and we place the child there. So in only a very, very small percentage um, are there situations where the children are placed in foster care. And when they are in our care, our responsibility is to work with parents as best we can to help them address their problems so the children can return to their care. Whoops. So, um, when does a, ch a Children's Aid Society intervene? So, as you see from the slide in front of you, there's, uh, there's more or less seven types of situations that the Children's Aid Societies get involved in. So people call us when they have a concern involving what we would classify as harm by commission. So someone has actually hurt a child, uh, or they're at risk of being hurt, either physical, physically harmed or sexually harmed. So what, in those situations, we get calls typically from, from um, schools or sometimes from extended family where they, they've heard something directly from a child or they suspect something from a child that they may or may, may not be hurt at home. The second category is around neglect. It's a harm by omission. So this is a broad category. This, these are situations where we would get a call perhaps from a school, maybe a principal calling because a little Johnny who's six years old hasn't been to school for maybe 50 days so far this year and they're really not sure why. Or from a mental health agency um, where the, um, the children's mental health agency who's trying to work with a parent um, doesn't really believe that the parent is following through with the treatment plan. There's other situations where kids' basic needs are not being met. So that falls under the second category of neglect. The third, is around, third area is around domestic violence. So this is actually an, a, a large portion of our work over the last 10 or 12 years, uh, we've seen a significant increase in the families that we become involved with where domestic violence is, is a primary issue. 
prior to about 10 years ago, there was a change in legislation that um, broadened the category around children who are, were considered at risk of harm. So it used to be that when, a, 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 let's say, a mother and a father were involved in a domestic dispute, unless a child was physically hurt, um, the police were not mandated to, to report that to, the, to a child welfare agency. But as you all know, there's certainly an impact when children are um, a witness to domestic violence. So again, that, that's, a, that's become a big part of our work in, in, in recent years. The next is around parent-teen conflict. And those are situations, more often than not, it's the parent themselves calling. So maybe a mother, let's call her Jane, she's having trouble with her 14-year-old daughter. Um, and often when parents like this call our screening department or our telephone intake department, they start the conversation really at a loss for how to help their their son or daughter, they're, they're worried perhaps around um, their um, conflict at home, school attendance issues, maybe they're involved in drug and alcohol problems, um, perhaps they're, they're breaking curfew or, or they're missing for long periods of time. The, the next ca category is around emotional abuse. This is where uh, people are phoning us with, with concerns around um, how a parent is treating their child whether or not they're, they're, um, they're cruel with, uh, in terms of their parenting. Um, they're way too excessive in their parenting or discipline approach. Um, or perhaps, again, they're not responding to a child's emotional needs. The, the sixth one is around substance misuse. And that's also a, a large group of families that we work with where the parent has a, um, a substance misuse problem where someone is calling, either uh, making an allegation that a parent is, is under the influence while they're parenting, um, or, um, or they're just worried about the parent may perhaps involved in some criminal activity um, related to their drug use. And the last is around a parent's untreated mental health issue. So we, we often get calls from hospitals or from uh, first responders saying they're seeing parents and adults who are parents in the community um, behaving in, in a bizarre fashion or they believe the children would be at risk. Now the reason personally why I stayed in this work for, for so long is that the families that we work with are quite com complex. So while someone perhaps has been brought to the agency, brought to the attention of the agency perhaps because, you know, little Johnny, six years old, is not going to school, when we kind of pull back the layers of the onion, what we really find is the reason why this little boy is not going to school is because the parent has a mental health issue. Perhaps his mom is having trouble coping with life and has anxiety, so she herself is having trouble getting out of bed every morning. So what happens when you call us? So if you were to visit our building, we have a, a, an area um, where we have about 12 workers who take calls every day. Um, we're, as I'm sure you know, we're a 24-hour, 365-day service. And during the day, we have these 12 workers um, take somewhere between 100 and 120 calls in, every, in, a, in a given day. And they range from um, things, you know, people see the word children in our title, and they call us to say, you know, do you have a number of a good daycare? And we, we refer them to the, we, we explain to them, you've uh, been misdirected, but let's give you the right information. Other people call us for um, what they would consider hypothetical situations. So a common one would be, um, can you tell me what the age that I'm allowed to, the age of my child needs to be that I can leave him alone for five minutes or an hour? Um, or someone calling saying, is it true that it's not against the law to hit, hit my son? Someone told me that. So we get a whole range of you know, what we would call consultation or just general questions that we try our best to answer. And then the larger portion, the much larger portion of the cases of the calls that we receive are actually referrals for a child protection investigation. So that's when someone is calling us to report um, an issue that concerns a child's safety and well-being. So when you get someone like myself or of the 12 or when it's night duty, there's a group of after-hours workers that they first call. When you first call, the first thing they're going to want to know is, 
a little bit about the incident. So why is it today at 11.30 on a Wednesday to, or Thursday today, why is it that you're calling? What did this little boy or girl tell you? Or what, why are you concerned? We're going to want to hear from you, uh, the caller, um, some of your understanding of the family dynamic. So talking about the strengths involved in this family. Perhaps if the teacher's calling, they, they would have a, a better sense of this family uh, other than this boy or, gr or d uh, girl making this disclosure. So we want to know a lot of information, as much information as possible. Um, the next piece says information only, me really meaning that um, sometimes we, we allow people not necessarily to identify themselves. So um, people are allowed to call us confidenti confidentially and anonymously, and um, we still take in that information and we make a decision if, we, if, if um, a matter needs to be investigated. We also link, peop uh, link the family with community resources. So sometimes when people call us, perhaps a parent who's struggling with their, with their teenager um, around the, maybe their school attendance or uh, maybe they're worried that their teenage uh, son or daughter are involved in an unhealthy relationship, peer relationship. We would link the family with a community health agency. Not everything needs to be under the purview of the Children's Aid Society. And then we come up with the last two points, a plan, a planning with the family, an investigation plan. So what, when people call us, they should have some expectation of what we're going to do with this information. Um, even though what we do with the family afterwards is confidential um, for privacy reasons, um, people who call us certainly um, have the, should have the expectation to know that this is something that is going to be investigated. And when calls do come into the agency, we have a decision to make that if we're going to investigate the concern, we're either going to re respond within 12 hours or seven days. And the, the, really the decision point is around whether or not something is immediately impacting the child's safety or whether or not we have some time to more, be more planful in responding. So just an example about a 12-hour response, certainly when someone's calling to say there's a child home alone, we're not going to say we'll be, be out there in three days. We're going to go out there right away. Um, but perhaps um, maybe there's some, there's some other issues that we, we don't need to respond to quite that day. OK. So now that Graham has given us kind of a good intro to what CAF does, we're going to start with the breakout group. We're gonna, I'm going to give you the instructions, and then Bram is going to provide you with a case study that you will use for your breakout groups. So the way I want you to imagine breakout groups is imagine that this is actually happening person to person. And uh, we're going to do the same thing that we would do if we were sectioning you off into different groups, corners of the room to work, except we're sectioning you off to work into different corners of the webinar. So your screen is going to automatically take you into one of four of those sections of the webinar, uh, you're going to see a set of instructions there, and you'll have access to two things. You'll have access to the discussion pod, which you're used to in terms of asking questions at the end of webinars. You've seen those before. But you'll also have access to a whiteboard. The discussion pod is for, of course, discussion to happen, so you can speak or communicate back and forth to your teammates. The whiteboard is where you will record your group answers. So based on the case study that we're going to uh, show you in a little bit, there's going to be a set of questions that will be provided. So we want you to take some time to reflect on the case study and discuss it with your colleagues or your teammates. You can choose one person in your group to record the final responses on the whiteboard. So you can choose that person. If you're really feeling eager, you can volunteer. If nobody volunteers, one of us will join the room and, and we'll pick someone. Uh, and so that person's going to record the answers on the whiteboard. After 15 minutes are up, we'll come back, we'll regroup, and we'll go through your answers. Uh, 
So this is our first time doing this. Uh, take your time. Uh, don't panic. If you have questions, that, at that point you can either send a message to Meredith or you can write your questions right in your group discussion and, and we'll see if we can pop in and answer them. All right. Off to you, Bram. Okay, so in the case number one um, is a, a family that um, is, is open to the society. We're, we're going to talk about a mother, let's call her Frida, she's 36 years old. She has two boys who are now uh, 15 and 13, Fred and Paul, that are currently in, in the care of the society. Um, the referral actually came to the attention of our agency about a year and a half ago. Um, from the mother herself, she was saying that she has lost control of her teenage sons. Some of the background, uh, background issues that you should be aware of is that the family came to Canada from Jamaica. So the mother, um, she gave birth to the two children in Jamaica, spent the, the first year or two of Paul's life with, uh, with the children, and then came to Canada on her own. Uh, to, to try and do some schooling, and then sent for her children. In the meantime, her children were being looked after by uh, the maternal grandmother for about eight years. Uh, during that time, uh, the younger son, Paul, disclosed that he was sexually abused by a family member. And um, the mom herself, when she called us, was really concerned about uh, the boys not going to school. She was worried about Fred that he um, would disappear for uh, long hours uh, after school, and she was worried about the kids that he uh, was hanging out with. She thought perhaps that maybe he was involved in a gang activity, in some gang activity, although she really didn't know what that, that meant. Um, she was worried that both boys were being uh, very oppositional and disrespectful to her. And Paul himself, who's, who's not, who was 13 at the time, uh, was starting to display some um, self-harming behaviors and had on two occasions been caught by his mother cutting his arm. So we'll, we'll put it to the group. Let me switch the slide to the questions that I want you guys to think about. The first is, is there a role for the Children's Aid Society? So um, obviously to some degree there is because I'm saying that there's, you know, this is a family that's open to, to the, our agency. But more specifically, what would or what is the role of a Children's Aid Society in a case like that? Certainly there's lots of problems within the family, um, both from the mom and from each, children, from each of the children. And then how would you work from your perspective, from a Children's Mental Health Agency perspective or from the community at large, how would you work with the Children's Aid to support the boys' uh, well-being? So I put it back to Renee to walk you through the next step. Okay. So just uh, we'll go over the instructions again. We're going to break you out, out into different groups. There will be four groups. Uh, one person can volunteer or you pick one person to record your group answers on the whiteboard. There's a discussion pod and you can uh, have your discussion with each other through that discussion pod. During this time, you won't be able to hear anything. Uh, how we'll be able to communicate with you is through a little announcement that will come up on your screen or if we actually join your group. But we can actually see everything that's being discussed. Um, so I'm going to switch us over now. And you're going to be, you're in the middle of being divided into groups. Okay, so you should be in your group.
All right. Thanks, everybody, for, for your active participation. I saw lots of great uh, comments. Um, I actually chuckled. I saw someone put in there that the case scenario was similar to something that was uh, put to them in, a, uh, in an interview somewhere. Uh, but jokes aside, that's, that actually is a real uh, family situation that, uh, that we have. Um, and really, the, 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 the reason why I brought this case forward is to, is to think about service coordination. So, you know, when families come to the attention of the society, it's really important that we partner well with the community um, because we had these kids involved, these kids and mom involved in many services. So, you know, things that were important from a children's aid uh, point of view was to get a trauma assessment for the child that was the victim of sexual abuse, to understand the cultural component uh, and the cultural community, how, how that is or is not important for this particular family. Um, for some, I saw a comment by someone saying that, you know, some parents, and it's true, some parents really don't uh, want to get support from their own cultural community. So something like the Jamaican Canadian Association, other families really uh, want to get help from their ethno-specific agency. Um, attachment was really important for this, uh, this family. Um, and programming for the boys, so they would, um, uh, would kind of stay away from, from trouble. So I want to go back to the, the presentation. Okay, uh, just, give, just bear, bear with me one second. I'm going to go on to case number two and just talk about another family, just to talk about the d different layers of our work. So we have a, a mother, let's call her Betty, she's about 54 years old. She has a youth who's living with her, Sally, who has an eating disorder. And the referral was from the hospital with concerns around the mom's follow through with treatment. So when, when the hospital social worker called us, they really felt like this, this mother didn't have a good understanding of um, Sally's um, mental health needs and was not following through appropriately. And so what was really important for us is to use what we would ca call a customized approach. So we don't, when we get calls from the community, we don't just serve everyone the same way. We don't respond the same way. I know what's a big concern to the community who are working with families such as counseling, they worry that when they call us that their relationship with the parent will be jeopardized so that the hospital social worker in this case was worried, you know what, if the Children's Aid Society calls Betty, the first thing that Betty's going to do is pull Sally from, from her treatment. And of course that, would, that was not at all what we would want. So we, we have to be mindful of how we're even going to make that first phone call. Sometimes it's most appropriate for us to tell the referral source, so in this case the hospital social worker, to tell the parent directly that, of their concerns and that they had a, a duty to report that to Children's Aid. And then together we came up with a plan to investigate the concerns. The other thing, once we became involved with the, the family, what was important to understand was the family's strengths. So while it was true that that Betty didn't have a, a very good understanding of Sally's needs. Um, she had a lot of other strengths in her, a lot of strengths in her parenting. She had a good relationship with her daughter. She was quite committed um, to caring for her. She was very involved with Sally's schooling. She had a good group of friends, so and a large network of support. So we tried to build on the parents' strengths. And. What, what ended up happening is that we, we were able to form a, a, a partnership with the mom to make sure that, that S Sally's needs were being met. And what that involved was some, some, some piece around education, some piece around uh, getting the mom her own counseling support, and then following through with treatment for, for this young person. And in that way, we were able to, to, to make a difference for this, this, uh, this youth. In case number three, we have a two-parent uh, fa family who are in the process of, of uh, divorce. Um, Wilma, who's 40, Frank's about the same age. They have three children together, Walter, 14, Kevin, 10, Barney, 4. And the referral was from the courthouse. So what happened was uh, Walter was arrested for um, stealing some small things from a, a local mall. And at the, at the bail hearing, um, 
the parents were in the hallway having a fight. The mom and dad were arguing with each other about who was responsible for Walter's behavior. They were blaming each other. They were talking about their infidelity uh, in their marriage. Um, and it kind of spilled out into the court scenario where that it was unclear who was going to be responsible uh, to make sure that Walter was going to follow through with the conditions that were set upon him from the youth court. Um, in this case, when we worked with this family, what, what I want to just hi highlight just very briefly, some of the things that we did with them. So even though that this is a family in, in the process of high custody conflict, one of the things we try to use with families is um, ADR, alternative dispute resolution. So even though the focus for the parents was on um, managing Walter, what we found was a big stress for them was just how they were co-parenting or actually, quite frankly, how they were not co-parenting effectively. And we were able to make a referral to mediation, which helped reduce the conflict in their parenting. Something else that we did um, is something called family, we had a family-centered conference. Now, family-centered conference is a, is a model of practice that we've been using at the agency for the last few years, where we basically have the parents tell us who's important in their family that could be of support to them. And we would share a meeting with the parents to see who, who in their family and who in their, in their lives, perhaps from the school. Um, in this case, when we had our, our meeting, we had um, Walter's teacher, his probation officer, um, several aunts and uncles come around the table. Um, Walter was uh, very involved in, uh, in some sports even though uh, his coach kept threatening to boot him off the team if he wouldn't get his grades up. So we had a big meeting, and the focus of the meeting was, how can everybody in this family best support the parents in caring for these kids? So overall, I want to just talk about how we help. So in these two, two other examples, I just I quickly went through. Uh, I talked about a customized response. As I said, not, no, family is, no families are alike, and we try to uh, customize our response to working with families in a way that's sensitive to them, and while, of course, not compromising a child's safety. We try to look at the family, not, ju not just from a deficit perspective, not what the challenges are, not only what the concerns are about the child's safety and well-being, but also what the family strengths are. Who is important to this child? So when kids both are in our care and in the community, it's really important for us to get a good understanding of who's involved with, the, who's involved with these children's lives, both from a professional point of view and from a personal point of view. We, we know that what helps kids the most is having healthy relationships with people. And while professionals like myself are, are really valuable, what's really, really important to kids are for, for them to be connected with people who have a personal investment in their safety and well-being. I talked about family-centered conferences, why it's important to bring people together to make, dis make decisions. So it's not on the Children's Aid Society to know what's best. It's actually the families know, know what's best for their kids. I talked about partnering and, and collaboration. Certainly, that was a lot of the discussion back and forth in your different groups in case number one. Um, where really a lot of our work, we see a m multi layers of problems. So we have people, uh, families where the parent has a mental health problem, and perhaps they're getting service through an agency around that, or a mom who has been the victim of domestic violence, she's getting some counseling around that. The child, him or herself, has um, uh, some developing school issues or some mental health problems. Um, so it's really important to work together and make it very clear what our various roles are. What's the, what's the Children's Aid Society worker? What's that family worker going to be doing with, the, with, with this individual family? What's the therapist role in this case? Um, you know, and what's the school involvement? I talked about alternative dispute resolution. Um, certainly from, our, from, our, from my perspective, our agency works from a position of that, yes, we do recognize that we have authority, we try to work hand in hand and in partnership with parents. And we didn't talk so much about this last one, uh, kinship piece, 
which is that um, we look to try to keep kids within their communities. Whenever, whenever, whenever it's, it's not possible to keep children with their own parents, we look next at um, keeping them with their extended family. The next slide, I want to talk about the duty to report. Anytime I'm given an opportunity to speak to a group of people, one of the big questions from people, I guess whether it's I'm standing in front of them or today sitting in front of a computer, one of the big questions that people have is around the duty to report. So I would say that years ago we established that working together is the best way to keep children safe from abuse and neglect. If people suspect that a child may be experiencing may be experiencing abuse, we all have a legal responsibility to call us. The Child and Family Service Act, and that's that piece of legislation I referred to earlier, that governs all of our work at the, in child welfare says, if a person has reasonable grounds to suspect that a child may be in need of protection, the person must promptly report the suspicion and the information upon which it is based to a children's aid society. So, and the words reasonable grounds really refer to someone with their own given training, background, and experience, uses normal and honest judgment. If they have a suspicion, they must report to us. The people in the community are not asked to do an investigation. That's the responsibility of a child welfare agency. We need people to call us when they have concerns. It's important to underscore the, that calls to the child welfare agencies are kept confidential. The families are not told who made reports about them, and in many cases, callers can remain anonymous. The exception is when family court proceedings occur, where a judge would require all information to be made available. I'm going to ask, after this conference is over, um, for Meredith or Renee to e email around. There's a there's a few-page booklet um, that's called Reporting Child Abuse and Neglect, It's Your Duty. It's a, a very short booklet with a few key passages, one of which I read from already, that talks about a professional's duty to report. So we'll send that to you after this uh, webinar is over. And now with the remaining time, I see it's about 12.15, uh, I'm certainly open to questions. Great. So I'm going to open up the question pod so you can type in your questions. And just something to think about, we've talked a bit about the role of CAS, Child Protection Services, the role that they can play uh, in the lives of children and their families who are struggling. So when you're thinking about your questions, think back to the beginning of the webinar when we mentioned or we talked about how important uh, solid coordination of services are to children and youth with complex mental health needs, right? Because we really want to figure out how do we strengthen the relationship and how do we strengthen the connection. So try to think about um, that as you're posing your questions. And with that, I'm going to put up the question pod, which is already up on your screen. So I'll give you a couple minutes to get, or a couple seconds to get your questions up. I see multiple people typing. Some time. Usually it takes a minute or two. So you might hear some silence. Okay, first question, uh, which is usually the first question. Will this slide be available for us to download? Absolutely. So you can get the reference that Bram made a few minutes ago as well as the slide on complexneeds.ca in the next couple of days. Next question, good question. How do you include support for the Indigenous child and youth mental health in your community? So essentially, how do you include support for Indigenous children and youth? Right, okay. So I, I think I'd answer that question a little bit more broadly, um, only because uh, in Toronto there's, there's four child welfare agencies, um, Children's Aid Society of Toronto, where I work from, uh, work at, uh, the Jewish Family and Child Service, Catholic Children's Aid, and Native Child and Family Service. So uh, those um, uh, children and families who are, uh, have a Native background, um, typically those families are being served by Native uh, Child and Family Services. 
But what is important that I want to highlight is a child's cultural background and community. Certainly, when we're working with um, uh, kids and families, regardless of their, their issues, we try as best as possible to work from a culturally sensitive uh, position. Um, what, uh, that, that, may, that may or may not involve um, getting them connected to uh, agency support in the community that, um, uh, that is from their, their same background, such as in the case example I talked about, the family that we made a referral to the Jamaican Canadian Association who was able to offer the family um, counseling and support. Um, being as we are in Toronto, we, we serve uh, families from all different backgrounds and um, we certainly uh, often use, uh, need to use interpreters um, to best be able to communicate with, with families. Uh, we're always looking for, um, when children in our, are in our care, we're looking to recruit and place children in uh, families of similar backgrounds. Um, and I talked about, uh, again, I talked about when we have to look uh, at serve, when we do look, when we do serve families, we look at trying to bring people who are important to the family around the table. Um, like, I think that's how I would answer that question. The next question uh, is around kinship and how we assess the homes. I know of families who have been accepted to be a kin home, but they cannot even raise their own children properly. Okay, so the, just to talk in general about what the process involves. Um, if, if someone, you know, comes forward and says, you know, I know my nephew or niece is in the care of the Children's Aid Society, and I would like to propose a plan to care for him or her, we have a department, a kinship assessment department of workers, social workers, who go out and visit people in their home to do an assessment. And what the assessment involves, the, 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 the basic initial assessments would involve uh, going to their home, seeing if the home is suitable for a child to live in, get a background check to see if they have previous involvement with child welfare or the police, talking about the relationship this person um, has with the child that we're talking about. Um, and that would just be the initial stage of, a, of an assessment. Um, if this would go positively, there would be some training offered for the person. Um, and uh, it involves many different uh, other aspects of it, including if a child's old enough, the child's own wishes about uh, living or not living with that uh, caregiver. I see there's, there's a whole host of questions that keep flying up, so I'm going to do my best to answer as many as possible. Uh, the next question was uh, from Blanca, if I'm pronouncing your name right. How does the Children's Aid uh, deal with lengthy waiting lists for mental health services? Uh, that's a very excellent question. Um, we struggle in Toronto, as I'm sure people on the end of the phone do in their uh, areas of the province. Um, where a lot of uh, counseling services and um, support for people have long waiting lists. Um, there's no real easy recipe. I can promote a little project that I uh, started with a colleague of mine. Actually, we were able to get some funding uh, from the Ministry of Health. We've partnered with CMHA Toronto that we have four of their staff on site uh, at our office that work exclusively with our clients who have uh, parent clients who have mental health issues. So they go out in the community with us, and there's no waiting list for that um, to do uh, assessments and intervention. But in the larger scope, in terms of families that have, that have needs that, where there's community waiting lists, we try our best with our own resources to help families, whether that be the social worker who's trying to do some parenting support, um, mediation to resolve some of the conflict between the parents, we try to be as creative as possible, certainly understanding that we don't have the answers for every, for every problem. Deborah. Um, I'm just going through some of these other... So the next question is from Deborah, which is, yeah. what was the ethnic background of families in cases two and three? Uh, what, this is only identified for some clients and not for others. If so, what's the difference? Well, I think that, you know, to, to, to be honest, I just put something together quickly just so it would highlight um, some of the key components of my presentation today, uh, just around the importance of system collaboration, um, how the various 
various players need to work together, how we as an agency work with families. Um, you know, case number two and three is, is, is more or less a hybrid of various cases that, uh, that, my, that our agency, and in fact, even my team is, is, is serving. But I think, Deborah, can I add something? You have a good question. We wanted to give a lot of detail for question number one, but your point is well taken that uh, details like that around ethnicity or the country of origin may not be as important, uh, may not have been as important for that particular one. Um, uh, but yeah, your point is well taken. Thank you for that question. Uh, how can you investigate when someone suspects a child's at risk, i.e., if I hear from someone that another parent is abusing or neglecting their child, how can I make the call when the person I heard it from could be lying and won't call themselves? That's an excellent question. So again, I, you know, when I spoke about the duty to report, it's all about the people who call with whether they have a reasonable ground to suspect that a child is being abused or neglected. We, you know, as a, as a child welfare field, we made a decision years ago that we're prepared to take anonymous calls and perhaps even um, I don't know if the right word would be fraudulent or, um, you know, people calling maliciously on each other. Um, we'd rather get some of those calls than dissuade people from making reports to a children's aid society. So we want to make it as, as open as possible to, uh, for people to call the child welfare agency. We'd rather go and investigate um, something and it turns out that everything's okay rather than not investigate a family situation where there's a child at risk. So yes, even if in situations where you're not sure if it's secondhand information that something may not be reliable, I would say call and then let's figure it out from there. Uh, Sarah James had a question. I find that I struggle with supporting kids that are 16 years old. What role can children's aid play for those who are 16 years old? I think, you know, the, the, the problem is that you're, you're writing here, Sarah, that you have a, your experience is that Children's Aid is pushing back on helping these families. The, the reality is our mandate in, in Ontario is that we're only able to um, investigate and support children who are um, from birth to, uh, all the way up to 16 years uh, old. Um, if they're in our care, we help families beyond, uh, children beyond that. But if they're in the community, um, unfortunately, it, it extends past our mandates. Uh, Catherine writes, is there a specific process for dealing with parents who have addiction issues and whose children have been apprehended, but parents are currently receiving treatment? Um, I'm not sure I quite understand your question, only to say that uh, what I would say is in my branch, in my department, where we work with families ongoing, um, it's about 40% of the parents that we deal with have either a mental health or addiction problem. So this is a large part of the work that we do. And, you know, I, I, would, I would say that we try our best to connect them with treatment. The, the first uh, uh, hurdle sometimes is just having the parent understand or acknowledge that they do have a problem. So a lot of our work with parents is, uh, focuses first on that. I'll go to the next question. What is typically the procedure when a child is uh, apprehended for continuity of care and ensuring that agencies who are involved in providing support are able to remain involved? Um, well, I, I guess how I would answer that, I don't know if there's a, a specific pre procedure in place, but certainly as a supervisor, what my expectation would be that when we bring a child into care, that we're able to connect with people who are an important uh, part of their lives prior to them coming into care. So, um, you know, typically this would involve, at minimum, uh, the children's school. Um, not, not so that we can, you know, gossip about what's happened, but more to understand what the child's needs are. Um, Often we're getting, when we become involved with a family, we don't know them before the referral. So we need, we're on the onset gathering information, so we need to reach out to people who <coughs> know the, the children much better than us. Um, Darrell asked a question around the, the, the older youth. Um, 
And the answer to that is, if we're if really if we're before the courts and w under what's called a supervision order, we are able to help uh, youth who are between 16 and 18 years up to their 18th birthday um, that are not in care. However, the, the the family must already be receiving services from our agency. So um, a 17 year old can't call us, from the, or a parent of a 17 year old can't call us that have never had any contact with the agency. Uh, that um, we can provide a lot of support for them. We have to make referrals to uh, the youth serving agencies in Toronto. Um, just does a does a kinship does a kinship person caregiver have to be a family member? Absolutely not. There's many situations where we have um, kin caregivers people who are from their kids' schooling uh, or from their community at large. There's lots of situations um, where there's an emergency and the best person who's ready at the drop of a hat to care for a child uh, is their neighbor or, or a family friend. So no, absolutely does not need to be a family member. Here's a question that I think a lot of people have on their minds, Bram, that you might be able to address, and it's just around um, CAS and what people think CAS is. So Caitlin's actually writing, I know that CAS has some great supports for families without taking uh, the children out of the home, but I think that some parents are afraid of accessing the support because, uh, because it's CAS and they think that all you guys do is take away their children. Do you have some thoughts on how to address that, especially if people are thinking about their work and making connections between their work and your work? Right. I think um, certainly from a child welfare perspective, when the intake worker visits the family, and even when cases go to ongoing service, um, when they have a worker, we, we know and we can appreciate that even if they're a cooperative client, somewhere in the back of their mind or even perhaps in the front of their mind, is a parent's worry that we, you know, we do have the ability to bring kids into care. So it's really important that we're clear on what our concerns are, um, what our expectations are of families when they ask us, what do I need to do to close my file? That we're, we answer that in a very, very clear way. Um, we should be, as an, as an agency, as a group of workers, we should be spending a lot of time um, talking with families about their specific worries and concerns. Um, and in terms of the partnerships with people in the community, I think, it, again, it, it's what I talked about earlier when I was talking a little bit about case number two. When, when a professional is calling us, perhaps someone, a therapist, is calling us, we should be spending time, the therapist with the assigned worker, on how to best collaboratively work with the parents. Because we, we, we certainly don't want to intensify the parents' anxiety about our involvement. And, and secondly, we don't want um, to sever the relationship between the therapist and the, or the referral source and the parent, because that will not be in the child's best interest. It is certainly not easy work, but it is certainly something that we need to be mindful of. And I would say when people call us, there, there's absolutely, you know, when they speak to the intake department, they, they should phone back in it within a few days and find out who the worker is and have these discussions directly with the worker. You've heard from me today about family-centered conferencing. Ask the worker, can I be invited to the family-centered conference? So that you, you're, that you, whoever the you is, is a part of that, that planning for a family. Another question that I just want to highlight, and I like this question because it actually asks us to think about context. So think about what are some of the systemic barriers that parents come up against that may not, uh, that may impact how they're able to. Um, parent their children in a, a socially acceptable way. So uh, Sarah James is asking, what can CAS, CAS do in situations where elementary age school children are not attending school? I have found that they tend to put all the responsibility on the school for getting them to attend when it's really an issue of parents not being willing and or able to get them to go. Okay. Well, certainly I can say that um, you know, we, we understand this, the impact of the social determinants of health. We understand the impact that other aspects of a family's life impacts on parenting, whether it be their housing, uh, their own per, the, the parents' own personal health issues, a variety of the, of the, um, of the other issues that would impact on their par parenting. 
Maybe it is their neighborhood which is impacting on a family's functioning. In fact, <clears throat> excuse me, in fact, if you look at, um, if you put a little, if you draw a map of Toronto and you put a little dot, one dot for every family that we serve, um, you'd see the brightest spots as in the shape of a U. So in the northwest corner and the southeast corner of the city, so in Melbourne and in the Jane Finch area and in downtown Toronto, those are the highest population of, of our families. And the, re the reason for that is because they're dealing, those groups of people often are dealing with mul multi-levels of problems. Um, so we, we, we know that these family situations are, are difficult. So I'm coming back to your, to your question, Sarah, around, so what, what happens when a child doesn't go to school? So we, we don't just look at it as, oh, the, the parent's just being neglectful. We try to peel it back to f figure out what's actually behind this child not getting to school. Is it the, 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 the child, him or herself, has a phobia around school? Is it the parent has some anxiety issue? Perhaps the parent has some uh, addiction problem that we have to uh, get out from under it. Uh, I would hope, uh, I hear what you're saying, and sometimes there are people who, who do get, have that impression or do have that experience. I don't want to take that away from you, Sarah, uh, that um, the pressure is on the, the school. Um, but when we are involved in a, with a family, I'd like to be able to um, peel it back a little, uh, peel back the layers a little bit and try to figure out what's causing, um, uh, causing the problem. Because uh, in a lot of cases, there really is a role for the Children's Aid Society. So we have time for about two more questions. So what I'll do is take the next two questions, which uh, one from Tammy who's asking about in-house services to support families, for example, parenting group, youth support, or do most families receive support from community resources and CAS uh, acts as a case manager? Um, yes, I, I would say that um, certainly in terms of uh, parenting groups and youth support, um, yeah, the, I would agree with Tammy in the sense of the children's aid in those, in those situations uh, more often than not does act as a case manager or someone who's coordinating uh, connecting these families with, with services. Um, the, re the reality is our workers are doing uh, work in the families' homes, um, uh, and we're trying best to help people, uh, parents improve on their parenting skills. But when it, when it comes time for uh, you know, ongoing support uh, or, or parents relying on each other to l learn effective strategies, um, that, um, that we're making re referrals to our community uh, resources. Okay, great. And the last question was, where was it? I think. Let's get the last, the one right after that. So we had, where is it? Can't we ask? Yeah, okay. Uh, so we had Caitlin. We have a discussion back and forth happening here. Here we go. I'd like to answer, sorry, yeah, you got one? Jump in. I'd like to an answer maybe in closing. Lisa Marie from Delisle asked the question around, how does the Children's Aid Society determine when, it ta when it's time to close a case? That's a great question. And the, the reality is there's um, the tipping point for us. When a, f when a parent says to one of my workers or any worker in the agency, I want my file closed. If they say that, no, the, the, the answer isn't we just close the file. We have to make a decision. If the parent is no longer volunteer, voluntarily working with us, we have to look to see whether or not we have enough grounds to bring the, to bring the family to court. So there are family situations where the child is not safe in their care or the parent is not responding uh, effectively or appropriately to the child's needs um, that it places the child at risk of, of further harm. So if we think that, the, um, that there's potential for further harm, then we do not close the case. It's only when a, a parent has sufficiently addressed the concerns. Either they are doing that on a voluntary basis um, or in some situations when we go to court. Um, parents sometimes themselves, just by saying, you know what, I no longer find you helpful, in a lot of those situations, we, we have to close the file. We may have some worries, but it doesn't reach the tipping point. Um, the, the, the legislation is very, very clear around the wording of w w what situation we can and cannot get involved in. Okay. 
I think we actually do have time for one final question, and this question goes to Jermaine. Uh, asking um, about some of the considerations around immigrant families. So a report of child abuse in an immigrant family, assessment, intervention, and the child is placed in a foster home. Abuse in our eyes, but a cultural, uh, in quotes, punishment, end quote, uh, for the family. Later on, the, the placed child develops mental health issues due to the family separation. How does CAS deal with the situation? Do they give a new assessment? Uh, does the child return to the family? What's the risk? It's a big question. Do you think maybe you can close off by just giving some comments on this question? And then we'll finish. All right. Well, you know what? There's, there's a lot of layers to that. Uh, maybe I can just sp touch on the issue of cultural, pun as Jermaine put in quotation mark, punishment. Um, certainly, um, a large part of the role of the, our intake department when they're getting referrals to, um, uh, when we're getting referrals about a family where a child's been, let's say, f f uh, physically disciplined, uh, maybe hit with a, a spoon, maybe um, in their the parents' uh, country of origin, um, their uh, the way the parent themselves was disciplined was they were hit with a belt or hit with a, an object of some kind. And they come to Canada and they, they use the same form of discipline on their own children. Um, it doesn't automatically mean we're taking their children. I hope after, after today's discussion that I really emphasize that bringing kids into care does not happen on the same type of frequency that is in the kind of public perception. Um, so we have a big role in terms of educating parents on more effective and safe uh, parenting strategies. Um, but at the, at the same token, there certainly are laws in Canada around, um, you know, physical, what, what is acceptable and not acceptable physical discipline. The same thing, there are laws in Canada different than other places in the world around domestic violence. A family that comes from perhaps one part of the world where um, a man striking a woman is acceptable when they come to Canada, and if they were to do that here, they would be charged. So, um, although there certainly is uh, a role in terms of education, and we're not, our response isn't, we're just going kind of quote unquote willy nilly bringing children into care, um, we, we do need to make sure safe plans are in place for children. Okay. So that's the last question we'll take. I don't know, Bram, if you want to have any final words to participants, or are you all talking uh, sure. about? Sure. No, I, I, I would just uh, finish off again by thanking the two of you for having me here and for CMHA having, uh, having uh, the Children's Aid come and speak to this important group. I would, I would just also conclude by, um, because I'm a part of the Speakers Bureau, we're always looking for um, people to volunteer of their time. We're looking for... Uh, people to uh, become foster parents, adopt children. So if you are thinking about other ways you can um, help children in the community, we certainly would be more than welcoming of your phone calls. Our, uh, our number to the agency is 416-924-4646. And again, I thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much for joining us, uh, Bram. We'll put the number up on our, our site as well. And again, just reminding people about what the take home um, of this webinar is we're, we're um, bringing CAS in to talk about what they do and really thinking about how do you build connections with other organizations who are working with children and youth with complex mental health needs and how important um, having a solid connection with other organizations in the, in the care plan is. Um, so thank you to everyone for coming out. Thanks for being such good sports around uh, trying the breakout groups. And most importantly, thank you for your great critical questions. So on that note, um, we will see you in January. We'll, so we'll take a break for the holidays. And we start up with the last leg of our webinars. In January, you will hear from us. And we're going to be uh, bringing forward some new and exciting ways of participating in the webinars again then. Have a wonderful holiday. Take care.
So what did you think? Please take five minutes to fill out a short evaluation survey of this webinar recording. Your feedback is so important to us for improving and advocating for other training programs. And all responses will be kept confidential and anonymous. Thank you very much.